to sum up their age, I'm exactly in the middle there. So this must be the reason. <clears throat> they asked me to do this. I met Amalia a few years ago, not many, she's younger, she's younger than my daughter, so this is a little scary. <laughs> And uh, I was impressed, uh, she's very motivated, she's very intelligent, she has a big background for being 27. And I mean, she's giving a keynote here, so she has a long road in front of her and it will be rich and uh, full of success. I met Giuseppe a little longer ago, I was 23 when I met Giuseppe. Way more stupid and way more, less intelligent than Amalia for sure. <laughs> But Giuseppe had a vision, I mean, he saw something in me, probably some little seeds. And I've been working with Giuseppe, for Giuseppe, in collaboration with Giuseppe since then. I mean, on, almost on a daily basis, I would say. We live a block away, we work in the same office. He has been my president, I am now the president of the institute he funded. So we have a long, a long history, a long relationship. The talk of today is a, a dialogue across generations. I mean, and actually these are two generations. I mean, I was talking with Tim Collins have a breakfast today and they talk about shifting baselines. And I mean, this is a case where this is actually true. Amalia has a completely different perception of the environment nowadays that uh, Giuseppe had when he came back uh, more than 30 years ago from San Diego and started seeing uh, what's in the Mediterranean Sea, how many cetaceans do we have, what species. I mean, we didn't even know we had isolated populations. I mean, it was really a different, uh, a different situation. And now Amalia has access to a wide variety of tools, uh, techniques, uh, information that will facilitate somehow her, uh, her career. So it's, it's really going to be interesting to see how they are going to present uh, this uh, different uh, perspective and, and different views, of course. And uh, I think that we should uh, give them the floor. I'm very honored and happy to present uh, Giuseppe Notarbartolo di Sciara and Amalia Anderini, please. Thank you, Simone. Thanks for the introductions. Um, good morning. Thank you for being here. It's early in the morning, so thanks. Uh, the idea of having a shared keynote with Giuseppe, we discussed this with the program planning committee. Uh, and I think Giuseppe initially, he didn't know what to expect out of it. Still uh, I, <laughs> I still think he doesn't. And I didn't either. I didn't know the end result. I knew I wanted the process. I wanted the the dialogue to happen before the true dialogue, which is today. So for me, it was an opportunity to engage with him, to learn from that process and have this discussion on key considerations of, on what make us do what we do today and how this influences the way we work and the impact we want to have and we will have. So um, Giuseppe is a mentor, a former advisor, a colleague and a friend. So it's a great pleasure to be sharing this keynote with him. Uh, the, the first chance we, we got to have was in the, pa in the last part of, in the last conference, which was in Puerto Vallarta in Mexico. And why for me, I was a student back then, and it was amazing to see this community coming together. Um, that was my first inspiration, my first chance uh, to, to experience and to engage with all of these knowledgeable and experienced people. But I realized I was one of the few students I was one of the few young participants. And we were already discussing about the future of ICOMPA, and which we're discussing today in this conference as well. And for me, there was something missing. So when the idea of having the ICOMPA in Greece and, and me being part of the team, it was no brainer really. I mean, it was evident for WWF Greece, the management team, that such conferences do not happen. These opportunities do not happen every day. So. Um, to grab this chance was, was also a no-brainer, but for me, there was an extra, an extra essence to this. I really wanted for this conference to initiate the, the dialogue of young pr practitioners of this region, of this country, coming together, discussing common issues, to have a stage, to have a voice, to have an audience, and be able to discuss them. In this conference, how many students and young practitioners are they? P please raise your hands. How many are you? Including the volunteers, of course. <laughs> Under 35, oh, 40. 
the the ancient stage also <laughs> the age limit. So there are a few of them, and and there is a large number of volunteers, and it's it's all it was also a way, and we worked hard to bring them here. Um, another thing is that being in this community, being in Greece, a country with limited conservation uh, tradition in marine mammals, is that all the young generation is either outside the country studying and conserving and contributing in, in marine mammal conservation or they're in Greece and they're not actively engaged because they don't have a chance to do that. There are not many jobs around and especially in this field and I know this is true for, for any other any field in Greece but in particularly in this field this is, this is true and with, with this conference I just wanted to have, and this keynote, just announce the beginning of such process and how important it is for me. Thank you, Amalia. Um, thank you for, for giving an introduction uh, uh, to this keynote so that I uh, also I can get an idea um, for myself of what's going to be uh, like this uh, Beauty and the Beast type of conversation, <laughs> and, uh, but uh, because really we are playing by uh, as, as it comes, we, uh, I mean, you, uh, of course you see that we have some sort of a script, but uh, uh, we are already out of it uh, at, the, at minute one, so uh, it's just like a, a Linus, uh, car, uh, Linus uh, blanket uh, is not going to be very much followed. So, um, uh, I, I think you're going to uh, conduct a little bit this, because the way you introduce this, um, uh, this is really the interesting part of this conversation, is not so much in making a comparison between two generations, or more than two, because we, we can say that we are about half a century apart, even though it's a little less than that. Uh, but um, uh, it, it is more to... Uh, facilitate the uh, introduction into the, you will call it this profession, this mission, this whatever, uh, to the youngest generation. So um, I, I think you should be the one who speaks most. Uh, but uh, let me say that, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, um, uh, I can uh, really capture uh, my position in, in, a, in a short sentence. I can say that my um, uh, professional life has been divided into three phases. The first phase uh, uh, was when I was mostly curious about the science of it, about uh, the uh, ecology and the, uh, the science, the, uh, uh, the biology of, of the large marine animals. Uh, then it became apparent that this was not sufficient, it was not uh, it was sort of um, uh, not enough that the, these uh, uh, animals had uh, an ecological problem. They have a survival problem. Uh, the population had a problem. We were losing uh, biodiversity. So it, uh, the science changed into conservation science. And now in the, uh, in the third part of, uh, of my professional life, uh, I think that even not that is sufficient. Because what we are doing really is that we are decreasing the quality of the life of the individuals. So now I am almost, uh, it sounds almost like a, a heretical, but I'm almost more concerned about the individual than I am about the population. So you've been in this field for 50 years now, as you said. Do you have a sense of success or failure? Um, you're not on a personal basis, I think uh, as, a, as a community, because personally, you know, someday I wake up, uh, I, uh, I have been successful, and another, the next day I wake up that there's a complete failure. So personal, I think we have to smooth out uh, this, and, uh, and, and I should try to, um, a little bit arrogantly maybe, to speak about the community that I belong to, and I think we have both. Uh, we certainly have uh, some major promises. We, uh, um, for example, in the Mediterranean, we have worked to assess the status. Of course, there is a lot of uh, gaps in this assessment. 
but we worked very hard, uh, you know, through ACOBAMS, IUCN, uh, uh, Citation Specialist Group. And uh, now we have a pretty good idea about what the status of the population is, uh, at least roughly, you know. And that's, uh, I think that's a good thing. Uh, we have a conservation community that we didn't have 50 years ago. Uh, we have marine protected areas. Uh, we have, uh, we have EMAs, as very recently. Um, we have conventions, you know, the um, Convention on Migratory Species, the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, the uh, uh, other uh, regional organization, ACOBAMS, uh, even the Barcelona Convention was at really at the beginning of uh, its uh, inception when, when I started off. Um, and uh, an increasing, perhaps small, but an increasing portion of the, uh, of the world has noticed. Uh, some pressures that are, were major in the Mediterranean, like pelagic lift nets, have gone away. So, I mean, these are all good things. And in fact, some populations are doing better than they did when, uh, when, when I started. For example, sperm whales, they were massacred by pelagic drift nets. Monk seals we've seen yesterday, they are making like a, 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 a timid comeback and we, we have hope. But we have a lot of challenges still. Some pressures have increased. Some are formidable, ecosystem change, shipping, noise, plastic, MPAs, I said before, but too many of them are paper parks. And let me make the example of the Pelago Sanctuary. Now, the Pelago Sanctuary was the first uh, marine protected area established in the high seas. Now, everybody's talking, and the UN, they're talking about making uh, MPAs in the high seas. So, Pelagos uh, could have been an incredibly um, uh, fecund, uh, example and, and source of creativity, of you know, thinking out of the box, of doing. And Pelagos is now thwarted uh, by the uh, pettiness of low-ranking bureaucrats. And in fact, if you look um, in a conference like this, which is on marine mammal protected areas, which is organized for the first time in the Mediterranean, you will see that Pelagos should have had center stage here, and it doesn't. So, these are all, you know, things that uh, make you think. Uh, worse than that, I think, because these are all seen cases, um, the ignorance for the need for conserving marine mammals and conserving the seas is still rampant. And uh, uh, the, uh, the greater public, I think, hasn't gotten the real dimension of the problem yet. Uh, politics are not helpful. Everybody is talking now about ecosystem services, but ecosystem services to whom? To humans, of course. I think ecosystem services should be to ecosystems. They should provide services to themselves so that they can continue to function and to every species that live in the ecosystem, not just uh, a, a new way to uh, uh, express the right of our species to appropriate. Because it's not only is not fair, it's not good for us. So ultimately, doing these bad things, getting a population extinct, getting a species extinct, is not yet seen as something terribly immoral. So this is what we have here. So let me ask you a question now. Um, looking at everything that has happened during this uh, past uh, half century, uh, do you agree that what is bothering me is important? Yes. Um, I think a lot has happened during the last 50 years, as you said. And it's easier to talk from my perspective because I haven't lived it, certainly. And that's the value to it, being impartial and have the audacity of the youth, if, if I may say. But I think there are a couple of things. You talked about science, but I think it has to do with the way the conservation science, the term, of, and what we mean about, on, uh, about it, um, it, it, it's what about. Uh, the conservation community has been nurtured 
and constructed by scientists, and which is normal, we didn't have the data, and we needed the data. But natural science has, to a large extent, dominated those discussions. Political decisions and conservation and management should be driven, of course, by science, but there's so much more that needs to be done. There are so many other parameters and towards preserving a population that needs to be encountered. And I think the conservation community has not been and able uh, to tackle those, those issues effectively. And I will explain that more. But from my perspective and in, in those conferences, in the discussions, we're focusing, our community is focusing on how good is the science we have? Is it enough? How conservative do we need to be when modeling? Can we rely on citizen science? We're, we're asking ourselves these questions, but these as, are er, esoteric in nature. We're only incrementally turning towards empowering and incentivizing local stakeholders, and in general, stakeholders in the planning process, taking kids in the field, collaborating with the media to tell a compelling story about what we do, engaging someone who has never been at sea to care about endangered populations of marine mammals. Today, I think all these are part of the area-based management processes, in theory, in theory at least. But this wasn't the case 50 years ago. It wasn't 20 years ago. And however, in practice, on the water, there is still much to be done in shaping the data into logic, simplistic, understandable, and visualized tools that can speak to different audience. And I'm not talking about the wider audience. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about policymakers, managers, um, industry representatives. But you talked about conventions. So now what we have is science and we also have conventions. There is a momentum there, but we're realizing the limits of this. There is another challenge that we need to encounter. While we do focus on the hand-holding and investing on bottom-up approaches, we cannot under underestimate or overlook which level the true decision-making power, the mandate to introduce and consolidate shift changes lays at. I think we're now starting to realize that we need to work in parallel levels in order to tackle these big, large-scale issues. Okay, but, uh, you know, I agree about what you say, but um, we are still, you know, bumping against the wall of uh, the conflict between uh, uh, protecting the environment, ensuring that the environment is in good shape, and all the uh, needs of uh, development, of growth, of um, a extraction of resources from the environment. Uh, in, in, in the end, uh, protecting nature entails a cost for human productivity uh, for socioeconomics in general. And decision makers have always given the precedence to the, 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 the latter, uh, rather than to the uh, protection of the environment. So we know this. Uh, this has always been happening. Uh, so what is new about this? How do, you, how do you address this? I don't think, of course I acknowledge that um, there are many trade-offs and conflicts which are completely opposite, which, in which nature preservation and human growth are on the opposite side. But at the same time, I think we're focusing too much on these real significant conflicts. I think there are many win-win situations where we can have impact and we should focus on the areas where true change may happen. Of course, there are big problems and people perceive nature preservation uh, as an obstacle towards growth. Um, but I think it also, the, the meaning of, of the true significance of the value of nature and its impact to human well-being, it's, um, it's not well understood and it's not acknowledged and appreciated. So neglect, neglecting this fundamental perspective, which is that human well-being cannot be truly achieved without nature preservation. Um, is, a, is, a, is a key in that, in that question. And what is new uh, from my perspective, and, and I think many of us share this, is that we're, we're now experiencing the consequences of that thinking, of what you, you said. 
we're, we're seeing the results, and not only that, we're experiencing those results of the thinking that strongly, that the thinking that strongly dominates the policies uh, that shape policies uh, through the set, um, that drive decision making uh, the centuries. But let me say something here. What has changed between your generation and mine, and it's not to compare them, but you grow up with challenges. You grow up and challenges were growing with you. This was a parallel process, the understanding of what were the impacts of pressures and threats. We're born, my generation is born into those challenges. We, we're born with the science, with paper parks, with conventions that don't effectively um, tackle the big environmental issues, including marine mammal conservation issues. You've done a good service to you. <laughs> you, you were looking at the future, projecting and imagining. I'm looking at the present and I must act. And this is a, a substantial, there, there is a substantial difference in that. And today the challenge is that we have accumulated data, but we need to translate it into concrete action and fight complex battles. We especially need to fight against nature alienation, based on which our societies have uh, been constructed. But at the same time, and we have no other choice to try to tackle those issues that are in play, which cannot be postponed anymore. So let me, let me ask you a question about the fight to conserve. Is it driven by science? And yet, if yes, is scientific research in silo? And how do we maintain integrity of science and advocacy? Can a scientist be an advocate? Uh major question, right? Um, yes. Um, I think that, uh, we, the, the scientists not only can, they should be at the same time, at the same time scientists and advocates, uh, if uh, we feel that we have something to advocate for. Uh, why in hell should a scientist uh, pretend to be emotionally detached in the name of scientific uh, objectivity when uh, witnessing the continuous loss of one's world, of the magic, of the beauty of nature. Why should we be imperturbable in, in front of this? Um, so there is a conflict between objectivity and passion, of course. But uh, there are ways out of that. Uh, an example, for example, is the, is the imas. So when you uh, strive to identify an ima, you are uh, only a scientist. Uh, you apply the criteria the way you think they should be applied. Uh, there's no emotion. Uh, the, uh, the EMS then gets submitted to uh, an independent review panel, which is even more heartless than, than you are. And, uh, and, uh, and then the EMS get on the map. At that point, if you see an EMA that is brutalized, uh, if you see the um, Hellenic Trench, which is important for sperm whales, that is being insonified uh, by uh, the search for a little bit of oil and gas, then why should you not be enraged? So uh, you don't have to be schizophrenic to be at the same time a, scientific, uh, a scientist and an advocate, uh, but you have to time correctly uh, your, the, and, and do the appropriate dosage to your uh, contribution to a given problem. So now it's for me to ask you a question. This is the script. <laughs> Finally, we're getting back to the script. <laughs> um, uh, let's jump a little bit also and jump quickly because we only have five minutes. Uh, you come from a country uh, where, uh, where a man more than 2,000 years ago had seen very clearly that dolphins are not fish. You know this man, his name is Aristotle. And uh, yet now you go in the street of Athens, of Rome, or Madrid, or wherever you want to go, and you ask the people, but do you think the dolphins are 
fish. And the people will say, of course, dolphins are fish. You know, they swim in the water, they have a tail, they, they, uh, they are fish. Um, so, what can you do about that? I mean, because this ultimately is a conservation problem, right? Yeah, this, this question makes me think of a book I read a while ago. It's called Trying the Batman, and it takes place in the U.S. in the 1800s. And it talks about a U.S. court dispute on whether a whale is a fish and on whether whale oil should be exploitable. And because fish can be exploitable, whale fish was not exploitable. And the story unravels a difference between natural historians and natural philosophers. Some thought that a whale is a fish, so, so the oil should be exploited. Another said, no, a whale is, is a whale, it's a different creature, and it shouldn't exploit that oil. So whale oil was eventually considered high quality, which legally meant that whales are not fish. But this, but the truth, um, truth, truth won not because of science. Truth won because it related to a particular set of interests that managed to carry the day. So as of today, uh, the question is, is like we're facing the same situation. People think that a whale is a fish, but apart from the phylogenetic ignorance, that's of course not, it's a marine mammal, which makes a big difference, but people still consider uh, that whales are a resource to be exploited, like fish. But in the face of large population declines, of extinctions, these perceptions may dramatically decline. But it may be too late to downturn um, the consequences of that thinking. Do we need to experience extinction to start realizing the value of marine mammals? And while we've achieved a lot in shaping policies to mature our perceptions, we're still not effective enough to, to change, to overturn uh, this thinking. So turning into something that you mentioned in the beginning, I'm curious on, of what you said. You talked about wildlife well-being a grant in a better quality of life to marine mammals. Could you talk about this a bit more? Yes. Uh, well, you know, when you work with uh, the animals, uh, you, uh, you get to know them better. And then realizing that marine mammals are sentient beings and not numbers uh, makes you think, you know, and you, uh, you wonder, and you uh, actually understand that there is no good reason why addressing sentience uh, uh, should stop at the boundary between humans and non-human animals. And uh, also realizing, you know, what are our responsibilities? Why, you know, the problems are actually coming from us? And that we share our space with them and by thinking what should be our position in such space? Not uh, one of dominance, because we are stronger, there is no question about that. Uh, stronger because of technology, not because of our muscles. Uh, not of dominance, but of co co coexistence, and we have a duty towards their individual lives. Uh, because maybe simply this is the only right thing to do. Uh, but this is not just rambling, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in, in a sleepless night. Uh, UNCLOS, for example, uh, the uh, UN uh, um, uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea recognizes to marine mammals a special status in Article 65 and 120. And then um, I, I think there is a recent development that I wanted to bring up here. And, and then I think we should stop, unfortunately. I would, actually, we started well. We could go on for a long time, but uh, we, uh, I'm going to be with Eric, the co-chair of the next se session. We have a conflict of interest here. And, uh, and I, I, I will ask you to stop very quickly. But I. I I wanted to say one thing. Uh, there was a very interesting development in the, uh, within the Convention on Migratory Species. Um, when uh, um, we were directed uh, by the parties, actually, to uh, investigate the conservation uh, uh, relevance of animal culture. And we had two uh, fascinating workshops. And the first one was on cetaceous. The second one. Uh, was on extending what was found in the first workshop to other species that uh, have this, you know, fascinating uh, property of using culture in shaping their behaviors. 
and, uh, and, and this is actually you know, moving on a scientific basis, not just on a, on a heartfelt basis, the uh, emphasis from the population to the individual. And uh, as a result of the last workshop we had in Parma about a, month, a year ago, uh, an article on the uh, Policy Forum of Science came out that uh, you know, had made this concept uh, very, very widely uh, accepted. So it's not just, uh, I don't think it's just you know, something that comes from people like me or many others here. I think it's something that deserves a very uh, careful and scientific examination. Yeah, this is, a, this is a very interesting perspective and we discuss this quite lengthy actually in our discussions. And while I do understand the ethical and moral standpoint uh, of this view of, of wildlife well-being, um, I'm not sure that we truly understand what sachins means for animals and for wildlife. I also believe that uh, this lays at the heart of everyone, but it doesn't mean that if you ask a policymaker or a manager or an industry officer if they care about stress levels of big whales from oil and gas extraction of the coast of the US, they're going to care about, which possibly would compromise uh, their economic um, returns, they would change their policies to care about the well-being of those But conditions. this is what must change. Yes. I need to focus on, I think we need to focus on how do we change that. Because the true challenge is to plant this emotion to everybody's hearts, to cultivate it, to nurture it, to transform these emotions into consciousness. And to make this process scalable across geographies and cultures, we need to provide and equip people with the tools to make this transition between emotions, between consciousness, into concrete action, and for the well-being of nature as one inclusive entity. And with that, thank you. Go for it. Are we ready in the next session?